Hello, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Mitch Zuckoff. I'm director of the conference and the Redstone Professor of Narrative Journalism at Boston University. Uh, if you lived through the Chuck Seward case uh, as it unfolded, as I did, you could be forgiven for thinking it was a known quantity or a closed book. And also, like me, you'd be wrong. In fact, as the reporting we're going to celebrate tonight was underway, Brian McGrory, who launched the project as the Globe editor at the time, repeatedly enjoyed telling me how wrong I was. <laughs> the conversations went like this. Brian would call and say, you're not going to believe what they're finding. Well, tell me. No, I can't tell you. <laughs> you know, just wait till the podcast. Well, tonight, in partnership with our longtime conference co-sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR, we're privileged to have three of the extraordinary journalists who rewrote history and revealed new truths and forced a belated reckoning for terrible wrongs done more than 30 years ago. I'm delighted to also report that uh, we're joined tonight by our Lieutenant Governor, Kim Driscoll. And this is yeah, an honor for us as well. Now, first, one quick note before I introduce our panelists. Uh, please stick around after the panel for a few words about an exciting new investigative true podcast, uh, true crime podcast, in which BUR's Amory Silverson re-examines and resolves a cold case of murder in Beyond All Repair. So stand by for that. So our panel tonight, I have the privilege to introduce Elizabeth Coe is an investigative reporter on the Globe's Quick Strike investigative team. She was previously a sole based correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, where she was part of a team named a Pulitzer Prize finalist for coverage of nursing homes dealing with COVID-19. Before that, Elizabeth spent three years at the Miami Herald, where her reporting on Florida, Florida's legislature helped change state laws and trigger multiple investigations into misspending at a major domestic violence nonprofit. Brendan McCarthy was recently named the Globe's Spotlight Editor. In that exalted role, he also oversees the Quick Strike investigative team, and Brendan spent six years the as the paper's Deputy Projects Editor, during which time he led the team that won the 2021 Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting. That blind spot series, as it was known, exposed the government's failure to keep tabs on some of the country's most dangerous drivers. He was a founding editor of the nonprofit Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting, which won a Peabody, IRE Awards, National Edward R. Murrow Awards, and other honors during his tenure. I have to say, I met Brendan at this conference uh, 15 years ago when he was a young uh, crime and corruption reporter at the New, York, New Orleans Times Picayune. He is still young to me. <laughs> and there he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2009. And Adrian Walker. Adrian Walker is an associate editor of The Globe and a twice weekly columnist whose work reveals the beating heart of this city. He's also been a friend of mine for 30 years, I'm proud to say. Adrian was a member of the Globe Spotlight team that was a finalist for the Pulitzer in 2018 for the series Boston Race, Image, Reality. After three years in his hometown, Miami News, Adrian joined the Globe in 89 as a general assignment reporter. He rose to uh, City Hall bureau chief, state house reporter, and deputy political editor before he became a columnist in 1998. He is both the voice of this podcast and a singular voice for social justice. Leading our panelists tonight is Ben Brock Johnson. And Ben is executive producer of podcasts at BUR. He also co-hosts the podcast Endless Thread. If you haven't listened, you must. And he serves as technical correspondent, pardon me, tech correspondent for Here and Now. And he's a guest host for BUR programs, including On Point. Please join me for a power of narrative welcome for our panelists. They're going to be up in a second. <laughs> How y'all doing? All right. I'm Ben. It's nice to meet you. This is an event that is fundamentally about a podcast. So we're going to start with some listening. 
And what I often tell people about podcasting or narrative audio storytelling is that beginnings and endings are the hardest and the most important. The middle is where you can get a little messy, but not too messy, because then it gets too long. Beginnings of narrative audio are best when you can set up some high stakes, some expectations for the story you're going to tell, and the questions that you want to answer. And I think this first clip of Murder in Boston from the podcast team at The Globe does all of those things. It is about six minutes, so buckle up. We're gonna sit quietly together and listen. And just so you know, the official contemplative narrative podcast listening position <laughs> is head slightly down <laughs> and slightly tilted. And you could close your eyes if you would like. You could stroke your chin or hold on to your chin. Um, and if we all do that, we won't worry too much about the fact that we're all listening together without earbuds, uh, which is not the usual podcast setup. So let's take a listen to Murder in Boston. Boston recorder, emergency 510. My, my wife's been shot. I've been shot. Where is this, sir? I, I have no idea. I'm off. Uh, I was just coming from Tremont, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's 843 on the night of October 23rd. 1989. Where are you right now, sir? Can you indicate to me? No, I don't know. I don't know. We drove up. We made us go to a, an abandoned area. A man calls 911 from his car phone. He's lost somewhere in Boston. Okay, sir. Can you see out the windows? Can you tell me where you are, please? No. I don't know. I don't see any signs. Oh, God. Chuck Stewart is in the driver's seat. His wife, Carol, is next to him. She's seven months pregnant. Okay, has your wife been shot as well? Yes. In the head. Moments ago, they were at a nearby hospital, taking a birthing class, preparing to welcome their first child. Okay, so bear with me now. Stand by. Stay on the phone with me. Chuck's from the suburbs. He doesn't live around here. All he knows is that he's on the wrong side of Huntington Avenue, and he's scared. He's crossed over this main artery of a road, gone past the dividing line. On one side of Huntington Avenue, You've got prestigious hospitals and fancy museums. Now, he's on the other side, in a mixed-race neighborhood called Mission Hill, a place that people from the suburbs know to avoid. Okay, Chuck. Help's gonna be on the way. Bear with me. Is your wife breathing? Feeling gurgling. Chuck says a man with a gun forced him to drive here. The people that shot you, were they in the area right there? Oh, they, they, they took off. Oh, they left. Okay. Carol is bleeding out in the front seat beside him. They're racing against an unforgiving clock. Oh, man. Jack. Jack, can you give me anything? Just look out the window. Can you see anything? Oh, I'm blanking out. You can't blank out on me. I, I need you, man. Jack. Jack. They're not the only people shot in Boston that night, but their story is the one that captures the attention of the nation for weeks. It will alter the image of Boston forever. It's something people here will be living with and talking about for decades to come. Topping News 7 tonight, a brutal attack on a pregnant woman and her husband as they left childbirth classes at a Boston hospital. The Stewart case was one of those news stories that exploded from inside your television set. Several police officers said tonight the stakes have changed in the street wars. I remember that evening saying whoever did this needs to go straight to hell. It was the ultimate urban nightmare. An innocent white couple with a baby on the way, shot in the heart of the city. We feel vulnerable because we are vulnerable. So many of us can see ourselves in the steward's car. This was one of the most sensational crimes in the city's history, and it was all captured on tape. In a time before smartphones and 24-hour cable news cycles, it went viral. From Boston tonight, we have a nightmare story of random crime and violent death. A near wipeout of a family that came into the suburbs. It is a dramatic and horrendous thing. The hunt for the attacker engulfed Boston for months. The crime and its aftermath exposed truths about the city and the country few wanted to confront. Race, class, crime, and punishment. 
the city's raw nerves were exposed. Everyone thought they knew what happened, but what you believed depended on the lens you brought to it. Boston's simmering tensions were about to boil over. Everything is building up to this moment in terms of how we really felt about each other. And this was the stick of dynamite that finally went off. Like life switched just that fast. Nothing's going to be the same again. That's what I said to myself. I knew at that moment. You can't make this shit up. Oh, but they did make it up. My name is Adrian Walker. I'm a columnist and associate editor at the Boston Globe. I was here when this happened. I saw it on the 11 o'clock news that night. And as a young reporter new to Boston, this was a holy shit moment. People were talking about race wars, martial law, the death penalty, all kinds of crazy stuff. They called the shooter an animal. As a transplant from Miami, I'd already been told that my experience in Boston would be different because I'm black. Back then, colleagues warned me to be careful going into certain neighborhoods, like South Boston. I'd covered crime in the city already, but this was different. I think it's the biggest embarrassment in the city of Boston, and they wanted to go away. But it never went away for me. I thought I knew this story inside out, but I've learned there's much more to it. Our team of Boston Globe reporters has been digging up all the old files and uncovering new investigative findings. How do you not come forward? I feel like at any minute someone might come in and take things away. It's absolutely crazy. Stay with us. We're going to tell the story in a way it's never been told before. We're going to tell the story the right way. I still feel the coverage has never really been done properly. They don't have us who it happened to side of it. And it basically boils down because they didn't really give a shit about us. This podcast is a look at the quintessential Boston story, a place where race and crime, fact and perception, all collide in a tragic way. And it all begins in Mission Hill. I'm a speak upon. Speak upon. Speak upon. Speak upon. All right, let's welcome Adrian and Elizabeth and Brendan up to the stage. That was great. As they're coming up and get settled, getting settled, can I just do a quick uh, like show of hands? Who's listened to the whole show? Margaret was first. Her hand was up first. I saw that. Um, who has not listened to any of it? Who has watched the TV series? <laughs> all right. All right, all right. That counts. Um, who has consumed the print product? Okay. Really interesting to, to sort of see the numbers in the room. Okay. Adrian, I want to start with you, if that's all right. Um, if you must. If I must. <laughs> um, in a way, you've had the longest history with this story on this stage, maybe. I remember some years ago when you first started thinking about this in a podcast, you told me that you had just gotten here from Miami, I think, as a younger reporter when this crime happened. And can you talk a little bit about your impression back then as a relative newcomer to Boston, as a black man, and as a reporter? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I've definitely got the longest history with this story. Um, I started at the Globe in May of 1989, so I'd been at the Globe for five months when this story happened and exploded. And uh, yeah, it was quite an introduction. I mean, crucible is a word a lot of people, a lot of us who went through it, used to describe covering this story, you know, because it was such an education in so many facets of what Boston was like in 1989. I remember, I feel like you told me a story about, um, as a GA, were you a GA, general assignment yes. reporter? Yeah, I was. And, and you got assigned to some sort of break in the case relatively early where you were, I don't know which river it was or where it was, but you were hanging out for a really long time. Yeah, it was the day, I guess it's okay to give it away. It was the day- Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers here. It was the day Chuck Stewart jumped off the bridge and the gun had been dumped in the Pines River, which is right where Rivera meets Lynn, I think, and yeah. I was assigned to, you know, go uh, hang by the river until they found the gun, which ended up taking a few days. You were there for a few days? Yeah, yeah. It was, I think it took four or five days wow. to uncover. Um, 
Brendan, you've obviously been involved in this project since since the beginning several years ago. It took three years, right? It's been three years about? Yeah, yeah. we stopped counting at some point. I mean, <laughs> to be clear, uh, you know, right? Like in journalism, we think like what length some or, or the, you know, time equates quality. And yeah. to, to be fair, the team um, had been chipping away a lot of great stories throughout. So we've been off and on for several years. Fair. Um, when did you like start to feel like this was worth tackling in a podcast, and 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 why did you sort of ultimately make that decision? Yeah, I mean, uh, to go back to the beginning, you know, at, in the wake of George Floyd during the pandemic, uh, Globe editor, uh, former Globe editor, now BU Wizard of Journalism editor, <laughs> um, he's got many titles, and 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 they're all um, um, well deserved. Um, had spun up a hub, a criminal justice hub. We doubled our resources to look at these issues that were taking place. Mm. And we had a team of, uh, of, of colleagues uh, that were you know, tearing apart the Boston Police Department, looking at you know, breaking a story of uh, hidden um, cover-ups, uh, molestation by a union chief. Uh, the commissioner resigned in the wake of a Globe report for uh, alleged domestic violence and all these things. But as part of that research, the team, we kept you know, brushing up against the past and looking at, you know, the, the, the police department said they were going to do all of these things. And it goes back to the late 80s, early 90s. As we see in so many cities, something terrible happens, you know, police violence. Uh, the Kerner Commission, the Christopher Commission, Chicago, LA and everything's gonna get fixed. We hear pledges from officials, they say, this will never happen again. And then, you know, years later, no one really goes back and looks, did it happen again? Mm. And here in Boston, it all goes back to the early 90s in the St. Clair Commission. We had one of those here in Boston, and that came in the wake of the Stewart case. Mm. Remember talking to Adrian and, and Brian McGrory? So we gotta do something here, because it, yes, it is about a crime, but it really is about a city and our identity, and who we were then. Actually, to steal Adrian's line, it's not a, a who done it, but a who we are. Mm. And we said, we gotta go big, <laughs> right? And then there comes the, uh, the, the challenging conversations in the newsroom, how big do we go? And you know, we're really privileged, uh, you know, uh, at that time, Brian said, let's, let's do it, and assembled a team of just aces, just exceptional, some of the best journalists around, and uh, forgive me, I also need to know, that, uh, Adrian, Elizabeth, myself, there are a couple of colleagues who aren't on stage with us, and that is Kristen Nelson, the New Globe head of audio, is a senior producer, tremendous. Evan Allen, uh, the lead author on that written print series that I didn't see all the hands go up, so I'm hoping you check that out as well, a, a very different product, but also a real ripper of a read, and Andrew Ryan, who is uh, wrapping up a Neiman Fellowship. And deleting a lot of voicemails <laughs> yeah. to the podcast. Spoiler, um, yeah. Elizabeth, how did you come to this story? What, what, what was your sort of like way in as a reporter as this story started to get unfolded on the team? So I joined the Globe in 2021. And the day after I started, Brendan called me. And he said, have you ever heard the name Chuck Stewart? And he went, no, who's that? And that was two and a half years ago, now that we're counting. But I had genuinely never heard of this case. Uh, Brendan and Adrian will give me a lot of grief about this, but part of it is because I was not born when the case had happened yet. Um, <laughs> Millennials. So, I, <laughs> so I, I came to the case completely fresh, that's what I'm trying to say. And in a lot of ways, I, I think that was what made reinvestigating this case with this team so fruitful. We had so many different perspectives. Adrian obviously had lived it. Um, our colleague Evan Allen, who Brendan just mentioned, had grown up in Quincy and remembered it when she was a kid. Uh, I looked at it and went, okay, all right, let's just start from scratch. And I think we all tackled it the way we would tackle any story, right? Uh, pull all the documents, talk to as many people as possible, just try to figure out what the heck was happening. Um, yeah. And for me, at least, I can say, it was really interesting to get into the case while also learning Boston as a reporter new to the city because as Brendan has talked about, you know, the case has such a through line to the present. 
And I was trying to get to know the city as a reporter, the people, the institutions. And the Stewart case was kind of the perfect primer to that. Yeah, it's a good way to do it, to get to know the city. And <laughs> um, I just want to remind folks, by the way, um, if you have questions for the panelists, I will read them. Um, you have to head to slido.com and enter podcast. Um, Adrian, as I said earlier, beginnings are important. Um, your podcast um, early on really starts with a crucial character, and that character is actually the neighborhood of Mission Hill. Um, and in some ways, it, it really feels, um, the, in the beginning of the podcast, when you talk about the neighborhood, it, it kind of feels like a love letter to that neighborhood. Um, can you talk about why introducing Mission Hill was important in this project? Yeah, well, to give credit where credit is due, I think it was really Brendan's insight that, that to treat the neighborhood basically as a character um, mm. in the, in the story. And I think it, you know, it was important for a lot of reasons. You know, this is where it happened. The people who live through it are carrying so much of the trauma of having been through this, which you'll hear throughout the podcast. But also, it's something that was overlooked a lot in the original reporting. You know, of all the things I wish we could go back and redo, you know, the the big hole to me is Mission Hill. So I was very happy to have a chance to go back and address that properly. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Adrian, right? Like, <clears throat> so often we're in a narrative conference and we think about, okay, who is the character? And we're talking about a story and, you know, the, the way it was told back then was through the prism, through the lens of, you heard it, right? That innocent white couple. And that's to take nothing away from them. But Today, when you look at you know the breadth of the victims and those who are most affected, we're not. Let me rephrase that: not most, but deeply affected, is the people in Mission Hill. So that was our thinking: like, how do we attack that? And we're so lucky to have you know folks like. I mean, you walk in Mission Hill, uh, and if, if, with Adrian Walker, and it's like, hey, Adrian. <laughs> uh, actually, I didn't mean that Rocky reference. Sorry, but <laughs> but you get my I've point. I've heard that before. I mean. <laughs> That, I, that is the first time I did that, and now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. But right, like, I mean, your experience just, it, it kind of, we, we interviewed Adrian time and again for this. Mm. And you'll see lines in the script, lines and are things that just Adrian mentioned over coffee or just random things like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, over the years, I had talked to a lot of people from Mission Hill just about it, not necessarily for a story or a column, just talking. And some of those people ended up in, in the show, right? Ron Bell and I had talked about Stuart over and over over the years. Tito Jackson and I had mm -hmm. talked about it over the years. And so I kind of knew where to go for some of the perspective we needed. Let's hear some voices. Um, and I think um, we're, we're kind of getting up to it um, just through the flow of the conversation. But Brendan, you wanted to play one of the montages in the series um, of people describing the aftermath of the murder of Carol Stewart and her unborn baby after her husband Charles tells authorities uh, a black man in a tracksuit shot him and his wife after a birthing class. Um, can you tell us a little more about what we're about to hear? Sure, this is a montage of, of Mission Hill residents, of, of people, of our, you know, our neighbors, our, you know, our fellow community members. And when we did that full court press in the community, we just, people opened their doors time mm -hmm. and again and say, I've been, I've been waiting 30 plus years to tell this story. Yeah. Um, and I know the clip on the top, the trailer, is a, is a tough clip to listen to. But I mean, there, there, there's a lot in this podcast. But this is one that actually gives me a goosebump still. I've heard this. Let's take a listen. Aftermath, a lot of people, is like, it's like a wild, wild west. It was scarce. You, you didn't really catch any people out there, really, because cops just ran through the projects and just ripped it apart. So people, I mean, everybody scat. They scattered. People are just straight scattered all over the place. You don't see people out there like you normally would at a certain hour. Some, you know, before that happened, people would be out there at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, just roaming, talking, doing what they do. No, that stopped everything. People would just used to see people booking, beelining to where they're going. You could tell they was walking in fear. But people everywhere were afraid. There was still a killer on the loose, and the police dragnet continued. Like I said at the start, there is a whole generation of black men who were shaped by these few weeks in late 1989. Listen to their voices. Well, after October 23rd, me and a couple of friends was walking down Parker Street. A 
couple of unmarked police cars pulled up on us, searched us, then pulled me to the side and asked me to take down my pants. I felt like my heart dropped out of my chest. I'm like, what the fuck did I do? I wasn't doing anything but going to work. I live in Roxbury and I was walking home and they just rolled up on me and threw me against the wall and started searching me. I refused to take down my pants. They was like, well, then if you don't want to take down your pants here, we'll arrest you. I was like, well, put the handcuffs on me. But before you put them on, it's going to be a fight. Driving home one day, I saw a whole bunch of young men with their pants and underwear down around their ankles on uh, Dudley Street. Hands against the wall. Cop got his gun out. And they're searching the kids and they're laughing. The cops are laughing. It is my business when I'm walking in my neighborhood and I have to walk down the street with a three-year-old child and see three men strip search in the middle of the street. They were doing body cavity searches on the street. These kids hadn't done anything. They were leaving church. You know, and I remember a number of us coming out, standing there and saying, don't worry, young man, we're watching and we will be there for you. They didn't get charged with anything because they hadn't done anything but they were stopped and humiliated by the police. Everyone walked around in fear. Now, how does, how, how does all of this make you feel? Well, it makes me feel uncomfortable. What do you mean by uncomfortable? Uncomfortable that my rights have been violated, that this is a free land to walk on. To me, it doesn't seem like a free land. Boston calls itself the cradle of liberty. We imagine ourselves as an example for the rest of the country, a city upon a hill. Our state house has an actual golden dome that shines in the sun. But the Stuart shooting stripped away that gilding and revealed what was underneath. Adrian, it looked like you were about to say something. Were you going to say something? No. OK. <laughs> Elizabeth, um, can you just talk about, um, I feel like a, a experienced reporters, when they get into a story like this, you, like you said before, you, you start pulling all the documents, you start talking to people. I feel like when you're doing a, a, a really long documentary, documentary series like this, you uh, can, as a reporter, get really obsessed with like one character or one thing or one set of documents. I'm curious if that happened to you at all working on this, a certain thing that you were like really focused on during the process. I can see Brendan cringing already, uh, thinking <laughs> of all the rabbit holes we all jumped down. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I think we had a couple for all of us, right? And one of the benefits to having a team of reporters who dug into this case and how we all did it together was that we all had different things we found particularly interesting that we were you know, really trying to get to the bottom of. Um, the montage of voices that we just heard, for example, right? That was Evan Allen and Andrew and Adrian, you know, going through the order files and trying to figure out how we could get to every single person that we could find who had lived in the neighborhood in 1989, right? Um, those voices don't just come out of nowhere. You've got to go looking for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot of time looking at all of the files that had been gathered during the police investigation to understand right, how the police had decided to focus on Mission Hill and lead to everything that you heard just now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, <laughs> I think for me, right, one of the things that I found particularly interesting uh, and one of the things that was new in our investigation, right, was understanding just how many people knew the truth about what had really happened with Carol Stewart's murder north of the river in Revere. Um, it was one of those things where you can see the story come out so clearly in front of you, right? It was what was happening in Mission Hill and almost in parallel, there was this game of telephone that was happening north of the river. Uh, Chuck Stewart's brother, again, sorry for spoilers, um, Matthew had inadvertently helped him get rid of the gun and told his friend um, and told his girlfriend and they told other people and they told their families and whatnot. And, and you did the math. 33 people, which is objectively an insane number of people to know that you've had a hand in killing your wife before anybody does anything. Um, but it, it was one of those things where the number itself was important, right? But it was also important because it was an illustration of 
what we were really trying to understand, which was what had the police missed in this investigation, right? How had they gone so far astray? Um, where were these moments that it could have gone differently? Not just for Carol Stewart and her family, but for all of the people of Mission Hill. Can I ask just about that? I, uh, and you're sort of leading into it. We have a great question from an audience member here asking about how y'all thought about your audience and their prior knowledge of the case. Anyone? It's an editor question. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yes, thank you, my friend. <laughs> um, so one thing, <laughs> let's just be clear. Uh, the fictitious black guy that supposedly did this, he didn't do it. And I, I realize many of you may know this story, but for those who don't, like, it was all bullshit. Okay. It was malarkey. Again, spoilers. But yeah. Yes. So I, can I do that? I don't know. I it's can, fine. Um, you just did. So, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot, and to just piggyback on what Elizabeth said, is there's some real hardcore, serious investigative findings, too, that come out throughout. There's a, there's a lot in there. But... But how, I mean, I, I will say we're privileged at the globe. We have a lot of really smart colleagues who think about audience. We know who our audience is. But we're also like, I mean, look at the team. Adrian lived this. Elizabeth was born in California. And we had this kind of breadth of different experiences on the team itself. So we kind of like test ourselves, like, you know what I mean? Adrian, like, oh, you know, folks back then knew it, but the other folks who maybe weren't around are like, are you kidding me, man? So, you know, having that kind of setup, I think was was really helpful. Mm -hmm. And we also, like, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, uh, call them like peer groups, but we really did a lot of back and forth, like, okay, where does this mean? And we're really, especially when it came to production time, super disciplined about, this doesn't make the cut because there's a whole lot of, fa of, of just fascinating stuff that didn't make it in. Yeah. And I mean, our audience, we have different audiences. We have our podcast audience, which is vast. And certainly as we found, you know, uh, national, there's our print audience, which is, uh, we had a very different experience for them. Uh, by the way, the print product is, uh, a digital product is quite a bit different than what you're going to hear in the podcast. And we actually heard a lot of really exceptional feedback from folks being like, I consume this, and then this, and then this. Um, so if you haven't, there you go. Uh, and then let us know, because we're still garnering feedback. So I'm serious. Like, let us know uh, what worked or didn't. Um, to that point, uh, I want to I, I not actually listen to something, but look at something. Um, one of the really powerful things that narrative podcasts can get away with, I think, um, is what I like to call the sidebar or the side mission. Um, you know, the miniature narrative within the larger narrative that at least in my experience at newspapers and radio often doesn't make the cut in the main story, but can really enrich the overall storytelling and long form documentary. And I think the soiling of old glory is a great example of this and how you tell this story um, in the show. Can we look at this Pulitzer Prize winning photo by Boston Herald photographer Stanley Foreman real quick? So, um, you know, this, this photo was taken long before the Stewart murder, right, during the, the busing crisis in Boston. Um, but you, you really tackle some of this history early on in the series. Um, and that seems important. Can you any of you, all of you, talk about how you decided to use this photo in the podcast and why that was important for the larger narrative? Here. Yeah, I'll talk about this yeah. first. Um, we sp the reason we spent so much time on this, essentially most of episode three, reviewing the history of busing, is that we wanted to give people a context for what the racial strife in Boston was like, what mm -hmm. it was about, and where it had come from. And that story really begins in 1974 with the beginning of, you know, court-ordered desegregation, as I like to call it. And... Uh, you know, and Ted Lansmark, of course, is a, you know, that's a huge moment in Boston history. It's a very famous photo, but Ted's also a person I know very well, and he's like a brilliant guy and great to talk to. So I knew right away we were going to, you know, Brendan says to me, you know, who can we talk to who can kind of put this in the context of busing? And I said, Ted Lansmark, of course. Yeah. So, you know, I interviewed Ted for a couple of hours, and then I took him to the site where, you know, where that happened. And that was, uh, that was one of my, I don't want to say favorite, but it was one of the most powerful moments to me. Yeah. in the podcast. 
And he talks a, a little bit during that interview. You have such a great rapport with each other, and it's it, to me it se seems like a shared. There's a shared experience there for both of you in listening to you talk. And he talks about how he, if I'm remembering correctly, he he really couldn't walk into City Hall yes. for like ten years without feeling that moment that he's um, that he's experiencing in this picture, right? And that was surprising to me because we had talked about it a lot over the years. I've known Ted since the early '90s when I covered City Hall and he was working for Ray Flynn, and he had never said that to me, you know. Mm. So he says, you know, I didn't walk I didn't walk in City Hall Plaza for six or seven years, and I was like, whoa. Tell me what that was about. And, hmm. uh, yeah, but it, it shows how traumatic it was for him. Adrian <laughs> is underselling it because he goes, oh, yeah, I went out there and strolled <laughs> through the plaza with Ted, and we listen to our, his colleagues listen to tape, and we're just wrecked. We're like, holy smokes. You know, It goes back to that earlier question. Like, Adrian w had the foresight to, to you know, I'm not going to talk to him in a, in a windowless room. We're going to go stroll the spot. And... Yeah. Uh, again, minds blown when we listen to that tape. The series has a lot of rich characters that help tell the story from lead detective Peter O'Malley to members of the Bennett family, former colleagues uh, like Eileen McNamara, who's a legend here. Um, I loved getting a little window into that journalist camaraderie, Adrian, you have with Eileen and how she ribs you for being a, quote, fucking podcaster <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> And as soon as she said that, I knew that was going to be in. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my all time favorite pieces of tape, and for me, a, a, you know, a brand new character in the story was Angela Brittle. And I think for me, the reason is that so much of the story is, to me, a, a, as a listener, about the dehumanization of black Boston residents and Mission Hill residents. But this tape we're about to hear, I just found to be so beautiful and humanizing. And it shows how powerful just simple tape can be. Um, this is just a woman talking about being a girl infatuated with a boy. So let's take a listen to that. He was a bagger for Stop and Shop, and I was a cashier on Westland Avenue. And that smile, oh, I was doing my thing, and I turned around and I was just, oh my gosh, this smile. I was sold by the smile. I am Angela Brittle, and I am the former girlfriend of Eric Whitney. Angela was 17 when she met Eric. Oh, girl. Oh, oh girl. <laughs> girl, girl, girl. He was 5'5". Five, five. He weighed about 140, 45 pounds. He was very slim. He had um, a, a long torso. And he was um, built like DMX. He had the muscles. He could wear the wife beater. He had a flat oh, stomach. And he had a oh, six-pack. Oh, OK. And he was, he was like a uh, chocolate brown. He had long eyelashes like a girl. Ways for days you could, get, you could just drown in them, girl. Oh, my goodness. And he, he cleaned his sneakers every day with a toothbrush and soap every single day. And he cleaned his face with ivory snow. Angela was living with her mom, and her home life was pretty chaotic. Eric was exciting and a little dangerous. He picked me up in a freaking stolen car, and I was in that stolen car, went to Mission Hill Projects for the first time. Man, listen, I went into the projects, like, Mission Hill, you didn't go into Mission Hill projects. Like, I mean, I'm from Dorchester. Like, yo, I will fight. Like, I like, I was what you call a hood rat. Like, you know, like shh, high top Adidas, tight jeans, carefree curl, ponytail, lollipop in the head. That was me, you know. So, but Mission Hill, oh no, ooh, the projects. They started dating. Eric was a funny mix of earnestness and swagger. He was sweet with Angela and cool with his friends. Beneath his tough guy act. Angela saw vulnerability. He was a um, typical street nigga. That's what he, he, he said. Um, he's like his daddy. He pimps hoes and slam Cadillac doors. I'm like, <sighs> one of them cats. Yeah, but little did uh, anyone know, he was a whole handful of virgin. Yeah, yeah. So I was his first. I'm sure none of his guys knew that he was King Virgin. 
I would have never known. Fine as he was with that beautiful smile. I just love that tape. Yeah, it's truly beautiful tape. Any reactions to that, listening, listening back to it? <laughs> it never fails to get exactly the reaction that we got here, right? Like, Angela jumps off the tape. She is standing in front of you. She's telling you all of this stuff. And uh, for a lot of us, because a lot of us had not done audio before, right, this was the mandate, come back with tape like this. Uh, and when we see this reaction, right, like, it feels worth it. We need to get her a column in the Globe. <laughs> Season two. So I think one of the most important aspects of this story and the way you told it was how you looked at the role of the media, including the Globe. This happens later in the series. Um, Adrian, you talk in episode eight, um, setting the record straight, we hear you talk about what it was like to be a younger reporter, a young black reporter who was interacting with other younger reporters of color. Um, and one of your fellow cub reporters from back in the day, who's now a columnist and associate editor, if I'm remembering correctly, is Renee Graham. Here's you and her talking a bit about the idea of black guilt and white safety. Let's listen to that. It always looked to me like they knew they needed to go out and find a black guy, and they went out and found a black guy. And we never bought this idea that Chuck was some kind of evil genius that had everybody fooled. It's how Charles played the faults of American history. He sort of turned that in this case, you know. I don't, I'm not even saying he was some sort of criminal mastermind. You don't have to be in this country to do that. It's been done before, and it's been done since. You know, Susan Smith with the children in South Carolina, you know, oh my God, the black man jumped in the car, and nah, she killed those kids. And that was another one that never made sense, you know, but everyone was just like looking for this black man. It's always somehow the mysterious black man who's done the terrible thing. In this case, the mysterious black man was Willie Bennett. It made me think of what it was probably like in the South when there was lynching. Like if people could have gotten their hands on Willie Bennett, he would have been gone. You know, he became Boston's boogeyman, Boston's black boogeyman. It just took hold so quickly because it was intended to take hold so quickly. Everything about that story was engineered to inflame racial tensions and to distract from the facts, you know, that a lot of it didn't make sense because people reacted emotionally to that story. They didn't react to it intellectually. It was all emotion. What the coverage did was ignite white fears, which are always there, which are never far beneath the surface, but this was the nightmare for them, you know, and everything about Boston just being lawless and overrun by animals and no one is safe. And no one always means white people aren't safe. That's what that really means. One of the things I love about this episode is that it sort of disassembles, we were talking a little bit about this backstage, it disassembles something that I think the media gets accused of all the time. We get treated like a monolith, you know? It's sort of the lamestream media, the vast media conspiracy. But we are organizations made up of lots of human beings, just like neighborhoods and communities of all kinds. We're messy. Um, most of us are, are trying to adhere to codes of of ethics and honor and ideals. And um, some of us actually don't end up doing that. And some of us don't seem to care. Um, and there's a, you know, a history and you, you talk about in the podcast of um, one columnist who uh, refuses to talk on the, poly, uh, on, on the podcast, former Globe columnist. Um, and, uh, you know, and was, was fired for um, uh, plagiarism. And so I just wonder how you came to this aspect of the storytelling and, and um, it, it seems really important that you bring this episode later in the series, this episode kind of deconstructing the media's role in what happened after the murder. Can you talk a little bit about that and the process of going through that internally? Anybody, everybody. Uh, we'd be derelict if we did not address these things. The gentleman's name that you reference is Mike Barnacle. He's a Globe columnist. Um, I'll leave it at that. Please listen. Adrian wrote a really thoughtful commentary. Again, the different products are slightly different. Um, for a, a column about this. And I also, you hear Renee Graham in episode eight, uh, a, a current Globe columnist, um, both of whom she started 
at the Globe the same time, around the same time as Adrian, and they went through this together. And I think it's what hearing them, we just sat in the room and, and let them talk. And that is one of my favorite uh, parts of that episode. I mean, I think Renee said it well, you know, that our role inflamed the tensions. It, it really did. And, you know, and she and I have both always felt that way. And I felt all along from the very beginning of, like, conceiving this project that we were part of the story and that we were going to have to deal with it. I, I never thought there was any way around it. I also think there was a little bit of this project where our motivation was to try to tell this story the right way, mm -hmm. right? Just purely from an investigative standpoint, like Brennan said, it felt important to understand the media's role in putting all of this together. But also, you know, as people who were going back to the folks who had lived this, right, asking them to tell us their stories again, it felt like if we're going to tell this right, we have to understand the role that we played. It's it, it was really, I, I mean, as a journalist, it was really um, cathartic to listen to that episode. It was really, um, really, really powerful. A um, couple of audience questions. How did your reporting and investigating of this case shape you as a communicator? Um, I'm not sure who this is for, but what did you learn about yourself throughout the podcast? Often podcasts focus on the self, the, the person who's telling the story. Well, I learned that I'm pretty old because I ended up talking <laughs> to a bunch of people I've known for 30 years plus, which was, <laughs> let me just say, an odd experience. <laughs> well, that's a great question for Elizabeth, in fact. Uh, what do you think? I, there's something about doing a podcast when you're a print reporter, right, where you have to confront the fact that you're actually holding the microphone. Um, I think when you're writing a story, it's very easy to write yourself out. Um, even when you're gathering interviews, I think you have to think about how you're asking the question because you're only going to get it once, right? The way somebody says something is as important as what they're actually saying. Mm -hmm. And in, in that way, I think, right, the biggest thing I learned from the podcast was how to do that communicating as an interviewer, as somebody who was going to these people, trying to convince them to talk. Uh, asking them these questions, trying to really understand where they came from. Yeah, but you use the word print reporter, and it, like, uh, if I may, like, you are a great storyteller, and we are here at a narrative conference, and this idea of like, there's print. I mean, yes, there are different tactics and approaches to this, but if you know a good story, um, and that is actually going back to an earlier thing we talked about, is we knew it was an amazing story, so we set it up all of our processes and our stages to maximize everything we could for every platform. And then we had all these great jigsaw pieces together and we sat down and we said, how do we do it? And you're a great storyteller. This team is just like, it, it, I could think of no one better. And the opportunity to do that. Um, I, I challenge everybody when you go back to your newsrooms, you know, you can, <laughs> you can do this. Do you believe that VPD has truly learned from the mistakes made in the case, or have they just gotten better at hiding their mistreatment of black people? <laughs> Nothing provocative about that question. <laughs> what, I've, what I've written before, and I'll still say this, is I don't think there was ever any consensus about the lessons to be learned to begin with. You know, James St. Clair, I guess there was a mention earlier of the St. Clair Commission. There was, the, there was a commission and there was a report that said, you know, the department ought to do the following 19 things to get its act together. So begin, job number one, firing the commissioner. Mm -hmm. I think there was always a lot of denial within the department that they had done anything wrong. And I think you hear it to this day. I mean, you hear it, you know, from somebody like Billy Dunn, right? They still think, you know, they sort of did the right thing. So do I think they learned a lot from Stuart? No, I don't. I think they have gotten somewhat better over time for other reasons, but I don't think they learned a ton from the Stuart case, no. We're getting some spicy questions from the audience, which I love. Um, so I'm gonna do another one. Do you think Boston will ever shed its image as a racist city? <laughs> he did do a whole series on this. <laughs> Is that more of a poll question for the audience? I mean, Adrian did, and I, I do want to shout out to you, The Globe did an award-winning uh, piece of journalism, 2016, 17, 17, 17 called the you know, Spotlight Series on Race. And if you haven't 
check that out. I do. I'm encouraging a lot here. Um, but do check it out. Adrian was part of that team. Uh, Patty Wen, who spoke at, um, at one of the panels uh, a few hours ago, uh, was the leader on that. And, um, you know, I believe, what was the tagline? You know, race. Boston race image reality. You know, it, 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 it addressed a lot of those questions. And here we are seven years later. Um, I don't know. You know, it's a very stubborn reputation, so I'm not optimistic. I, you know, I got an email one day from a friend who's a reporter at the Washington Post who had spent some time in Boston, mm -hmm. and he said, this podcast reminded me of all the reasons I hate Boston, <laughs> you know? And, I, you know, I think that's a little of the answer. I think that I, I wouldn't say we'll never get rid of that reputation, but it certainly isn't changing very quickly. If we were to look for a sign of hope, um, I was really struck by Ned Sullivan and his, I think his name is Ned Sullivan, Neil. right? Ne I'm sorry, Neil Sullivan. Um, he's the top aide, uh, he was the top aide uh, to the mayor when the Stewart murder happened. You talk a lot about this in the series. And Neil, um, he is self-aware, I think, in your conversation with him about what happened, what went wrong, and how he would do it differently. Do you feel like you heard from a lot of people who are meaningful, who are involved in the podcast or connected to the podcast, who are meaningfully thinking about this after the podcast has come out? Yeah, I do think so. I, I think it has made a lot of people think again about the roles they played in this story, uh, particularly people in government and, and to some degree in law enforcement, too. Yeah, you know, I would stop short of calling it a reckoning. But certainly there's been some reconsideration. I will also say we did try to reach out to a number of folks who definitely had not changed their minds at all. Uh, for those of you who have listened to the podcast, you may remember the beginning to episode seven. Uh, one of the people that we tried to reach out to, uh, that our colleague Andrew tried to reach out to, was a former state police trooper by the name of Dan Grabowski, who had gotten a tip partway through this investigation that Chuck Stewart was actually the killer, and he had never done anything with it. So we did what good journalists do, right? We called, we asked, what'd you do with this information? Um, I won't spoil the voicemail. It's worth listening to. Uh, I can also say that Andrew got a lot of texts for several months um, after that initial attempt at a conversation uh, where it was pretty clear, right, that this kind of reflection was not happening. Oh, a tiny bit of hope, though. My favorite bit is is Chip Greenwich. Um, it's uh, it, it is a true spoiler, but there is a gentleman who um, is now in the community, who, in a roundabout way, you know, um, this helped shape him. Uh, helped his, yeah, it shaped him, and he is now giving back. Uh, it is one of the most hopeful things that I've encountered in years, mm -hmm. and that's how the podcast actually ends. Um, and, you know, talking about the next generation, we hear a lot. We joke, Adrian hates the term New Boston. Other, you know, outlets, uh, folks have mentioned this, New Boston, right, because of some of the changes. We have, you know, Mayor Wu, uh, Michael Cox, but there, there's conversations happening. Um, again, is that enough? I think, you know. You seem like, again, you were about to say something. I was. I mean, you know, it's changed somewhat, but I, I don't think anybody's under any illusions, mm -hmm. you know, that we have a long way to go. What's your biggest hope for the podcast's impact? Again, maybe related to the conversation we're just having, but what's your biggest hope? My biggest hope was always just that it would prompt the conversation we never had. You know, in 1990, Stuart jumps off the bridge. Everybody says, let's move on, led by Ray Flynn, who was the mayor at the time. Yep. And that's sort of what happened. Or, you know, as Diane Wilkerson put it to me in an interview, you know, one day we just stopped talking about it. And we need, it, we need to go back and look at it. We need to confront it. We need to ask ourselves the questions that were never resolved. My fondest hope is that we've taken a step now in that direction. The, you know, what happened in December with the mayor feels connected to that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, fill the audience in. No, you, you, please. Adrian, what was it like for you? I mean, because you got called out. Adrian <laughs> walks across the same plaza as that photo, 
goes into City Hall because there's a press conference. You're sitting there. People are hug- like people are hugging you, sh- you know, lauding you. It, yeah, what was that like? I'm 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 I'm, I'm quizzing you. <laughs> I thought you were answering questions tonight. Come on, man. <laughs> I, I miss working with you every day. <laughs> uh, mostly it was embarrassing, but no, it was, you know, it, it was an illustration of how much this project has meant to people, which was, which was fabulous to see. Absolutely. The, the mayor issued an apology, yeah. uh, not only to the family of Willie Bennett, but also to Alan Swanson, another gentleman who was wrongly linked and whose life went off the rails because of this case. Uh, and she issued this kind of broad apology to the black community. Um, there is a, a bonus episode that just went out that centers just on that event, hmm. and uh, the images are stark and moving. And it 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 was, it was yeah. The mayor, thirty four years later, basically told the black community, uh, "We're sorry." I mean, it, I've covered countless events in City Hall. It was hands down the most dramatic, emotional event I've ever been at in that building. How's the Bennett family? I don't know, is the short answer. Um, you know, they talked, they talked to some extent to HBO. Uh, Joey Bennett, Willie's nephew, sat down with me the day after he did that. Um, I've run in across them a little bit since, but I really can't say how they're feeling right now. But, I mean, you know, I hope they're feeling better, and I, I think they are, but I don't know. And, I mean, they did speak at this apology presser, you know. Right. Mayor Wu invited his family. Um, invited Alan Swanson, who we had been trying to track down for a while, and who did in fact show up. And you know, Joey, I remember saying quite emotionally, right? Like your apology is accepted. And to get back to the hope question you were asking a little bit earlier, right? Like to get to see that is part of, I think, what we had all hoped for with the mm-hmm. podcast that the people we had talked to, um, the people who were closely involved, right, that it would do something for them. How has that been, uh, the folks in Mission Hill? I mean, how has the response been there? Some of the folks that we hear in that first montage, have you talked to some of those folks after the podcast has fully come out? Oh, yeah, I've talked to a lot of them, and it's been hugely positive. I went to an event last week where the room full of Mission Hill, it was an annual fundraiser or whatever for an after-school program in Mission Hill, and it was full of people who had gone through through this whole thing. Some of them were people who had been in the podcast. And they were so glad we did it. Hmm. And they were so happy to finally hear their story told. Adrian's neglecting to mention that he was at this thing because they were giving him an award. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've I forgot gotten, that part. I think we've all gotten several bear hugs from Chip uh, and you know other folks too. And, um, and the, the conversations it sparked in various kind of k- at kitchen tables um, is, is, is quite heartening. Hmm. So you just going to do podcasts now or are you... No, I have, a, the column. I have I a column that is one. up on the Globe website yeah. as we speak. I wrote it a couple hours ago, and uh, I'm, I'm back to my day job. What was it like? It was really, it was actually really, um, it was really fun to get to know you as a podcast host and to settle into your storytelling. Um, and that was, as I understood it, a relatively new experience for you as a, a very experienced journalist, but a noob when it comes to podcasting a little bit. What was that like? It was a completely new experience. I'd barely listened to podcasts when we started this. <laughs> and uh, I found that having written 2,000 columns was not any kind of preparation for hosting a podcast. <laughs> so it was definitely a process. But, you know, it eventually was fun. And um, <laughs> definitely <laughs> Like around episode three, I stopped hating it, and <laughs> on episode six, I was like, yeah, this is okay. That's good encouragement for you in the room who <laughs> want to start a podcast. Um, I want to congratulate y'all and the rest of your team for really a breathtaking, compelling podcast that um, isn't just as, you know, an incredible retelling of a murder case, but a heartfelt profile of a community and a really, I think, a sweeping exploration of the city and the city's past and present. Um, so thank you for making this show. Yeah. Um, thank you all c- for coming. You're not free yet. Um, We have one more excellent piece of audio to unveil for you all this evening. 
Uh, so keep your butts in those seats. Um, before I play that for you, let's thank our panelists one more time. Thanks, y'all. That was great. All right, so our last special thing is a preview of WBUR's new podcast, Beyond All Repair. And to make it totally worth your time, we've got a little, shall I say, swag incentive. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage my colleague, senior producer, reporter, and my co-host for the podcast, Endless Thread, Amory Sievertson. Amory, come on up. Hello. Hey, buddy. What's up? How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Great job up there. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, for newbies, Endless Thread tells internet mysteries, untold histories, other wild stories from the internet, but we're not really here to talk about that. Not right now. Um, Amory has a new project uh, that we're going to sort of preview for you all tonight. It is called Beyond All Repair. I'm a huge fan. I've listened to all of it, mostly. Episode 10, I'm still waiting on, but. Yep, it's coming. Um, <laughs> uh, we just wanna um, give you all this little preview of this show. So, Amory, take it away. Thank you. Yes, I'm here with, uh, with an offering and an opportunity. So, the offering part. First, because I did see a lot of hands, I just wanna say I did see a lot of hands of people who have not listened to Murder in Boston yet. So first, I really do just wanna encourage you to listen to that, spoilers or not, you have not heard this story. You cannot, there are no spoilers for the way that they tell this story. So please do listen um, to Murder in Boston. But also for those of you who did, um, and either way, you know, you're here because you love rich investigative work. And so I am hopeful that you will also love Beyond All Repair. And uh, I want you just for a minute to imagine that one day you were accused of murder which is unthinkable for most of us, fortunately, but you are accused of murder and you swear you didn't do it. But someone says that they saw you do it. And that someone is a person who's very close to you. And so as a result of this, nobody believes you. This is what happened to a woman named Sophia Johnson. Um, 22 years ago, she was accused of brutally bludgeoning her mother-in-law to death and for the last three years, she's been telling her story to me. So I've also been going through her case file. I've watched all of the trial footage. I've been talking to everyone involved. As Elizabeth said, that's what you do. And I've been trying to figure out what actually happened. And by the end of the series, I do. So there are four episodes out already. There are six more coming. Um, and because we have this big, beautiful screen behind me and sound system, I figured that I would play for you a very, very short video trailer that we have. So Chris, hit it. Did you kill Marlene Johnson? I think you're one of the first people to have actually asked. How could that be when you were put on trial for murder? Because I wasn't asked, I was told. You know, I know this happened. We know you killed Marlene. Just tell me what happened. Sophia Johnson was 23 years old and newly married when she was accused of brutally murdering her mother-in-law. Her head was beaten in uh, with fireplace tongs. Sophia swears she didn't do it, but someone says they witnessed it. The person kind of took, it was like stocking off of their face. It turned out to be my sister. Two siblings at odds at the center of a murder. My brother did this to me. For the past three years, Sophia has been telling me her side of the story and about the son she was pregnant with when the murder happened and hasn't seen since he was born. The question is, is she telling the truth? She played the whole damn family. Sophia got her own agenda, my brother. I don't know, I feel like I got punched in the face. Somebody should be in jail for murdering my sister. Beyond All Repair, coming March 7th. Be careful. You're digging in a place that's been very peaceful for a while. Do it anyway. Dig.
And now, the opportunity. So um, Ben was hinting at this a little bit before with his totally. But if you pull out your phone and you subscribe, yes, right now, I'll wait. <laughs> and you subscribe or follow Beyond All Repair on your podcast app, where you are also going to listen to Murder in Boston, right? Yeah, either either works. We subscribe agree. to one or both, whichever one you haven't subscribed to yet. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's a QR code right here. Candace is right over there. Yes, Candace. If you show Candace on your way out that you have subscribed, she will give you a WBUR tote bag so that you can carry around all your cool conference things for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> so just do that on your way out. And we have one more order of business, right? Do we? Yeah, we have to, we have to, we have to oh, mug yeah, a few people. Oh, yeah, we have to, yes. In addition to the totes, we have the names of the winners of the WBUR coffee mugs. Ben, would you like to do the honors? Sure, I don't know. Sure. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's do it together. Okay. This wasn't sealed, but <laughs> I think it's okay. And the winner is La La Land. Just kidding. Um, we can take turns. You want to do? Amy Littlefield, you in the house? Amy Littlefield. I heard it. Woo! Oh, all right, Amy. All you right. get a mug. You, got, you get a mug. Oh, they're a really nice color, too. All right. All right. She, she also has a very nice purse. Very nice FYI. purse. Okay, I am going to mispronounce this, and then you correct me, okay? Mars Giro, Giroliman. Giroliman? Giroliman. You get all a right. mug. You get a mug? Congratulations. Rebecca Edwards. All right, you Rebecca. You get a mug. You get a mug. All right. And, and Spencer sp to Barry. Spence? Spencer? You around? All hey. right. Hey, congratulations and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks to the Globe. Okay, Mitch oh, is going to jump yes. up and say a few words. Listen up. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, you know, we talk about the power of narrative, and, and just to sort of state the maybe the obvious, you know, if you think about Boston and, and how history is told, it's told through stories. And if you, you know, what Nightmare in Mission Hill joins uh, the pantheon uh, of Boston, or the, if you want to understand Boston in the past 50 years, you read Common Ground, and then you read Black Mass. And then you listen to, and then also read, Nightmare in Mission Hill. And that's the power of narrative, to encapsulate an entire city, an era, a moment, in a single story that says so much more than just the story that you think you're there for. So that's why we're here. That's why we run this conference. I just want to give one more quick thank you to our amazing panel, to Adrian, Brendan, and Elizabeth. Ben, fantastic job. Thank you for that. I want to thank Amy and Candace and her staff. I want to thank Margaret Lowe for lending us this amazing stage and being a partner, such a great partner to us. And thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Nine o'clock starts with John Woodrow Cox, an amazing uh, keynote and a very, very full and fun day. Thank you. <laughs>